And so tonight, Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air open a new cycle of broadcast dramas with a radio production of their greatest stage success to date, Shakespeare's Caesar. And here is Orson Welles himself to tell you about it. The director of the Mercury Theater, the star and producer of these programs, Orson Welles. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Julius Caesar was produced last year by the Mercury Theater without benefit of toga. Inevitably, it was as timely last October as it was 1,650 years after Caesar's murder when Shakespeare wrote it, and it is as timely today. Shakespeare's great political tragedy about the death of a dictator, which is also the personal tragedy of a great liberal, exists in all times without identification or special reference to any time. Its story is real Roman history, and its source is the Roman historian Plutarch. From the Plutarch text, for the medium of radio broadcast, we have arranged a running commentary on the action of the play. No voice is better known and none could be more suitable than that of radio's outstanding news commentator, Mr. H. V. Kaltenborn. And so tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System begins the new series of the Mercury Theatre on the Air with Orson Welles' world-famous production of Julius Caesar, starring the original New York cast. Orson Welles as Brutus, Martin Gable as Cassius, George Kalouris as Antony, and Joseph Holland as Caesar. With music by the celebrated American composer Mark Blitzstein and H. V. Kaltenborn as the narrator. Mr. Kaltenborn. This is the history of a political assassination, the killing of a man who tried to make himself king. It is an account of how the murder was prepared, how it was carried out, and what happened later to the men who took part in it. When the Civil War was ended, Caesar was 55. By Pompey's death, he had made himself the most powerful man in the empire. His countrymen now made him dictator for life. Honors were conferred upon him, which seemed to exceed the limits of ordinary human ambition. A conspiracy was formed against him, headed by Cassius, one of Pompey's generals, whom Caesar had pardoned after the Civil War. The 15th of February was a national holiday, and there was a huge gathering of the people. As Caesar went through the streets, a strange voice was heard in the crowd, warning him to prepare for some great danger on the Ides of March. Beware the Ides of March! Caesar paused for a moment, and then, as the voice was still, marched on between the rows of soldiers who guarded him. tongue swiller than all the music cries Caesar. Caesar! Ah! Who called? Speak! Caesar is turned to hear. Beware the eyes of March. What man is that? What sayest thou to me? Speak once again. As soothsayer bid you beware the eyes of March. Set him before me. Let me see his face. Come from the throng. Look upon Caesar. He is a dreamer. Let us leave him. Pass! Pass! This was the day on which Cassius, the leader of the conspiracy, first came to Brutus, the most honored man in Rome, and tried to enlist his aid. What means this shouting, Cassius? I do fear the people choose Caesar for their king. I think you would not have it so. I would not, Cassius. Yet I love him well. But wherefore do you hold me here so long? 
What is it that you'd impart to me? I cannot tell what you and other men think of this life. But for my single self, I had as lief not be as lived to be in awe of such a thing as I myself. I was born free as Caesar, so were you. We both have fed as well. We can both endure the winter's cold as well as he. For once, upon a raw and gusty day, the troubled Tiber chafing with her shores, Caesar said to me, Darest thou, Cassius, now leap in with me into this angry flood and swim to yonder point? Upon the word, accoutred as I was, I plunged in and bade him follow. And so indeed he did. The torrent roared and we did buffet it with lusty sinew, throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. But ere we could arrive the point proposed, Caesar cried, Help me, Cassius, or I sink. I... As Aeneas, our great ancestor, did from the flames of Troy upon his shoulder the old Anchises bear, so from the waves of Tiber did I the tired Caesar. And this man has now become a god. And we, petty men, walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Now the games were over, and Casca joined them. He told them what had just taken place in the forum. Speak with me. Aye, Casca. Tell us what has chanced today. Why, there was a crown offered Caesar. And being offered him, he put it by with the back of his hand, thus. And then the people fell a shouting. Who offered him the crown? Why, Antony. Tell us the manner of it. I can as well be hanged to tell the manner of it. I saw Mark Antony offer him a crown, yet was not a crown deed that was one of these coronets. And as I told you, he put it by once. But for all that, to my thinking, he would fain have had it. Then he offered it to him again, and he put it by again. But to my thinking, he was very loath to lay his fingers off it. And then he offered it a third time. He put it a third time by. And still as he refused it, the rabblement hooted and clapped their chopped hands and uttered such a deal of stinking breath because Caesar refused the crown that it almost choked Caesar. For he swooned it and fell down at it. And for mine own part, I durst not laugh for fear of opening my lips and receiving the bad air. Did Cicero say anything? Aye, he spoke Greek. To what effect? Those that understood him smiled at one another and shook their heads. But for mine own part, it was Greek to me. There was more foolery yet, if I could remember it. And so it is. For this time I will leave you... Cassius, what you have said I will consider. What you have to say, I will with patience hear, and find a time both meet to hear and answer such high things. Till then, my noble friend, chew upon this. Brutus had rather be a villager than to repute himself a son of Rome under these hard conditions, as this time is like to lay upon us. Farewell, both. Mark Anthony, Caesar, let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-headed men, and such as sleep o' nights. Yon Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. He is a great observer, and he looks quite through the deeds of men. He loves no plays as thou dost, Antony. He hears no music. Seldom he smiles, and smiles in such a sort as if he mocked himself and scorned his spirit that could be moved to smile at anything. Such men as he are never at heart's ease whilst they behold a greater than themselves. And therefore are they very dangerous. Fear him not, Caesar. He's not dangerous. I rather tell thee what is to be feared than what I fear. For always, I am Caesar. In the weeks before the murder, many strange prodigies and apparitions were observed. There were fearful storms over the city. The conspiracy continued to spread. Who's there? The Rome. Cassius, by your voice. Your ear is good. Good evening, Sinner. Brought you Caesar home? What night is this? A very pleasing night to honest men. 
Are not you moved? When all the sway of earth shakes like a thing unfirmed? Oh, Cassius, I have seen tempests when the scolding winds have riot the nutty oaks. And I have seen the ambitious ocean swell and rage and foam to be exalted with the threatening clouds. But never till tonight, never till now, did I go through a tempest dropping fire. I saw you anything more wonderful? Oh, they were drawn upon a heap a hundred ghastly women, transformed with their fear, who swore they saw men all in fire walk up and down the streets. And yesterday, the bird of night did sit, even at noonday upon the marketplace, hooting and shrieking. When these prodigies do so conjointly meet, let not men say these are their reasons, they are natural. Indeed, it is a strange, disposed time. Whoever knew the heavens menace so? Those that have known the earth so full of faults, now could I send a name to thee, a man most like this dreadful night? A man no mightier than thyself, or me? Caesar, that you mean? Is it not Cassius? Indeed, they say the senators tomorrow mean to establish Caesar as a king. And he shall wear his crown by sea and land, in every place save here in Italy. I know what I will wear this dagger, then. Hold my hand, and I will set this foot of mine as far as who goes farthest. There's a bargain made. Come, sinner. You and I will yet ere day see Brutus at his house. Three parts of him as ours already, and the man entire upon the next encounter yields him ours. Brutus agreed to meet the conspirators in the garden of his house. The men who came that night were Cassius, Casca, Cinna, Trebonius, and Decius Brutus. It was decided that Caesar should be killed in the Senate the next day. Shall no man else be touched but only Caesar? Decius well urged. I think it is not meet Mark Antony, so well beloved of Caesar, should outlive Caesar. We shall find of him a shrewd contriver. And you know his means, if he improve them, may well stretch so far as to annoy us all. Which to prevent? Let Antony and Caesar fall together. Our course will seem too bloody, Caius Cassius. To cut the head off and then hack the limbs. For Antony is but a limb of Caesar. Let us be sacrifices, but not butchers, Caius. We all stand up against the spirit of Caesar, and in the spirit of men there is no blood. Oh, that we then could come by Caesar's spirit and not dismember Caesar. But alas, Caesar must bleed for it. And gentle friends, let's carve him as a dish fit for the gods. Not hew him as a carcass fit for hounds. Peace. Count the clock. The morning comes upon us. We'll leave you, Brutus. Give me your hands all over one by one. And let us swear our resolution. No, not an oath. If not the face of men, the sufferance of our souls. But time's abuse. If these be motives weak, Break off the times and every man hence to his idle bed. So let high-sighted tyranny range on till each man drop by lottery. But if these, as I'm sure they do, bear fire enough to kindle cowards and to steal with valor the melting spirits of women, then, countrymen, what need we any spur but our own cause to prick us to redress? What other bond than secret Romans that have spoke the word and will not palter, and what other oath than honesty to honesty engaged. But this shall be, or we will fall for it. When Caesar entered the capital, the senator stood up to show their respect for him. Of the conspirators, some came about his chair and stood behind it, and others stood in front of him and talked to him. Casca, that stood behind him, gave him the first wound in the neck. Some say that he fought and resisted all the rest, shifting his body to avoid the blows and calling out for help, but that when he saw Brutus' knife drawn, he covered his face with his cloak and submitted letting himself fall at the foot of the pedestal on which Pompey's statue stood, which was wetted with his blood. Et tu, Brute? Then fall Caesar. Liberty. Freedom! Here it is, Dad! Let hence proclaim, cry of 
across the street. Pete! Freedom! Pete! Get the Freedom, liberty! How many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted over in state unborn and accents yet unknown? How many times shall Caesar bleed in sport that now on Pompey's basis lies along no worthier than the dust? So oft as that shall be, so often shall the none of us be called the men that gave their country liberty. What? Shall we fought? Aye, every man away. Here comes Brutus Mark Antony. Shall lead. Here comes Mark Antony. Welcome, Mark Antony. I know not, gentlemen, what you intend. Who else must be let blood? Who else is rank? If I myself... There is no hour so fit. I do beseech you, if you bear me hard now, whilst your purpled hands do reek and smoke, fulfill your pleasure. Live a thousand years, I shall not find myself so apt to die as here by Caesar and by you cut off the choice and master spirits of this age. Oh, Antony, big not your death of us. What compact mean you to have with us? Will you be pricked in the number of our friends? Friends, am I with you all and love you all? Upon this hope, that you shall give me reasons why and wherein Caesar was dangerous. Our reasons are so full of good regard that were you, Antony, the son of Caesar, you should be satisfied. That's all I seek. And I'm moreover suitor that I may produce his body in the marketplace and in the pulpit, as becomes a friend. Speak in the order of his funeral. You shall, Mark Antony. Brutus, a word with you. You know not what you do. Do not consent that Antony speak in his funeral. Know you know not how much the people may be moved by that which he will utter? By your pardon. I will myself into the pulpit first. Mark Antony. Here, take you Caesar's body. You shall not in your funeral speech blame us, but speak all good you can devise of Caesar and say you do it by our permission. Else shall you not have any hand at all about his funeral. And you shall speak in the same pulpit whereto I am going, after my speech is ended. Be it so. I do desire no more. Prepare the body then. And follow us. Then Antony was left alone with the body of the man he had loved best in the world. Oh, mighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils shrunk to this little measure? That I did love thee, Caesar. Oh, tis true. If then thy spirit look upon us now, shall it not grieve thee dearer than thy death to see thy Antony making his peace, shaking the bloody fingers of thy foes? Most noble, in the presence of thy cause, had I as many eyes as thou hast wounds, weeping as fast as they stream forth thy blood, it would become me better than to close in terms of friendship with thine enemies. Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth, that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. Thou art the ruins of the noblest man that ever lived in the tide of times. Woe to the hand that shed this costly blood. Over thy wounds now do I prophesy, which like dumb mouths do ope their ruby lips to beg the voice and utterance of my tongue. A curse shall light upon the limbs of men. Domestic fury and fierce civil strife shall cumber all the parts of Italy. Blood and destruction shall be so in use. And dreadful objects so familiar that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered with the hands of war and Caesar's spirit ranging for revenge with Arte by his side come hot from hell shall in these confines with a monarch's voice cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. <laughs> Then Brutus came down from the capital among the crowd and made a speech to the people who listened 
without expressing either pleasure or resentment, but showed by their silence that they pitied Caesar and respected Brutus. Be patient till the last. Romans, countrymen, and lovers, hear me for my cause, and be silent that you may hear. Believe me for mine honor, and have respect to mine honor that you may believe. Censure me in your wisdom, and awake your senses, that you may the better judge. If there be any in this assembly, any dear friend of Caesar's, to him I say that Brutus's love to Caesar was no less than his. If then that friend demand why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. Not that I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. Had you rather Caesar were living and die all slaves than that Caesar were dead to live all free men? As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at it. As he was valiant, I honor him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. There is tears for his love, joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. Who is here so base that would be a bondman? If any speak, for him have I offended. Who is here so rude that would not be a Roman? If any speak, for him have I offended. Who is here so vile that would not love his country? If any speak, for him have I offended. I pause for a reply. None, 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 none. Then none have I offended. I've done no more to Caesar than you will do to Brutus. Here comes his body, mourned by Mark Antony, who, though he had no hand in his death, shall receive the benefit of his dying. A place in the Commonwealth, as which of you shall not, good countrymen? Let me depart alone, and for my sake, stay here with Antony. Do grace to Caesar's corpse, and Grace's speech, tending to Caesar's glories, which Mark Antony, by our permission, is allowed to make. With this I depart. But as I slew my best lover for the good of Rome, I have the same dagger for myself when it shall please my country to need my death. When Brutus was gone, the body of Caesar was brought out into the forum, all mangled with wounds, and Antony made a funeral oration to the people in praise of Caesar, and finding them moved by his speech, he unfolded the bloody garment of Caesar and showed them in how many places it was pierced and the number of his wounds. He also told them of Caesar's will, in which it was found that he had left a considerable legacy of money to each one of the Roman citizens. For Brutus' sake, I am beholding to you. What does he say of Brutus? He says for Brutus' sake, he finds himself Brutus. beholding to us all. For best he speak no harm of Brutus. Yeah. Caesar was entirely... We are blessed that Rome is rid of Caesar was entirely... You gentle Romans. Caesar was entirely... Romans! Countrymen! Lend me your ears! I don't see what Antony can say. I come to bury Caesar! Not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. And it was so. It was a grievous fault. 
and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honourable man, so are they all, all honourable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me, but Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. <laughs> Ambition should be made of sterner stuff, yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? <laughs> Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, I'm sure. He is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to say what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withhold you then to mourn for him. Oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. Methinks there is much reason in his sayings. If thou consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had great wrong. I fear there were the worst by his place. He would not take the crown. He would not take the crown. But it certainly was not ambitious. And big crown, Poor soul. His eyes are the man who all the He begins again to speak. But yesterday, the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there and none so poor to do him reverence. Oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honorable men. I will not do them wrong. I'd rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honorable men. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. It is his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood. Yea, beg a hair of him for memory, and dying, mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. <laughs> not read it. It is not meat. You know how Caesar loved you. You're not wood. You're not stones, but men. Yes, and yes. being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it would inflame you. It would make you mad. Yes, it is good you know not that you are his heirs. For if you should, or what would come of it? Let's hear the will. 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 Will you be patient? The will! Will you stay a while? I have o'ershot myself to tell you of it. I fear I wrong the honorable men whose man. daggers have left Caesar. I do fear You will. Compel me then to read the will. Yes. And make a ring about the corpse of Caesar. And let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend? And will you give me leave? Come down, descend. You shall have leave. Room for answer. Most noble, I Silence! Shh. A ring. Stand round. Stand from the hearse. Stand, Stand back. Room. Stand from the room for answer. Stand, Stand back. back. If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all don't know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. It was on a summer's evening in his tent, that day he overcame the Nervii. Look, in this place ran Cassius' dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this the well-beloved Brutus stabbed, and as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it as 
rushing out of doors to be resolved if Brutus so unkindly knocked or no. For Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. This was the most unkindest cut of all. For when the noble Caesar saw him stab, in gratitude more strong than traitor's arms quite vanquished him, then burst his mighty heart, and in his mantle, muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen, then I and you. And all of us fell down, whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep, and I perceive you feel the dint of pity. These are gracious drops, kind souls. What, weep you, when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded? Look you here, here is himself! Mud as you see with traitors! <laughs> oh, villains! Oh, traitors! Revenge. 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 Vengeance! Vengeance! Say, gentlemen! We'll hear him. We'll follow him. We'll die with him. Good them. friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. They that have done this deed are honorable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not, that made them do it. They are wise and honorable and will no doubt with reason answer you. I come not, friends, to steal away your heart. I am no orator as Brutus is. But as you know me all, a plain, blunt man that loved my friend, and that they know full well that gave me public leave to speak of him, for I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the powers of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. Tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor, dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus, and Brutus Antony, there were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits, and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny. We'll mutiny. We'll burn the house of Brutus. About sick fire kill slay. Go fetch fire. Why, friends, you go to do you know not what. Wherein hath Caesar thus deserved your love? Alas, you know not. I must tell you then, you have forgot the will I told you of. Here's the will, and under Caesar's seal, he gives to every several man, to every Roman citizen, 75 black men! <laughs> He has left all his walks, his private arbors, and new planted orchards on this site, Tiber. He has left them you and to your heirs forever. Common pleasures to walk abroad and recreate yourselves. Here was a Caesar. When comes such another? Now let it work. Mischief thou art afoot. Take thou what course thou wilt. In the streets there was nothing to be seen but confusion. Some cried out to kill the murderers. Others tore away the benches and tables out of the shops round about, and heaping them all together, built a great funeral pyre. On this they set the corpse of Caesar and set fire to it. Then they took brands from the pile. Some of them ran to the houses of the conspirators. Others ran up and down the streets to find out the men who had killed Caesar and tear them to pieces. That night Brutus, having said farewell to Portia his wife, left the city. In the months that followed, the empire was divided into two factions, some going over to Brutus and Cassius, others to Antony and Octavius. Two years after Caesar's murder, the armies of the two factions 
came face to face on the plains of Philippi. That night, Brutus sent for Cassius to come to his tent. There had been dissension between them lately. There was talk of corruption in Cassius' army, and Cassius himself was not above suspicion. done me wrong. Wrong I, mine enemies, and if not so, how should I wrong a brother? That you have wronged me doth appear in this. You have condemned and noted Lucius Pella for taking bribes here of the Sardians, wherein my letters, praying on his side because I knew the man, were slighted off. You wronged yourself to write in such a case. In such a time as this, it is not meet that every nice offence should bear his coming. Let me tell you, Cassius, you yourself are much condemned to have an itching palm to sell and march your officers for gold to undeserved. I, an itching palm? You know that your Brutus that speaks this, or by the gods this speech will else your last. The name of Cassius honors this corruption and chastisement that therefore hide his head. Chastisement! Remember, march! The Ides of March. Remember? Did not great Julius bleed for justice sake? What villain touched his body that did stab and not for justice? What shall one of us that struck the foremost man of all this world but for supporting robbers, shall we now contaminate our fingers with base bribes and sell the mighty space of our large honors for so much thrash as may be grasped thus? I'd rather be a dog and bathe the moon than such a Roman. Brutus, bait not me, I'll not endure it. You forget yourself to hedge me in. I am a soldier, I, older in practice. Abler than yourself to make conditions. Go to, you are not, Cash. I am. I say, you are not. Hurt me no more, I shall forget myself. Tempt me no farther. Away, slight man. This possible must I endure all this? All this? I more. Wretch, your proud heart break. Must I observe you? Must I stand and crouch under your testy humor? By the gods, you shall digest the venom of your spleen, though it do split you, for from this day forth I'll use you for my mirth. Yea, for my laughter, when you are waspish. It come to this. You say you are a better soldier. Let it appear so. Make your vaunting true, and it shall please me well. For mine own part, I shall be glad to learn of noble men. You wrung me every way. You wrung me, Brutus. I said an elder soldier, not a better. Did I say better? If you did, I care not. When Caesar lived, he durst not thus have moved peace, me. Peace, peace, you durst not so have tempted him. I durst No. Not. What durst not tempt him? Your life you durst not. Do not presume too much upon my love. I may do that, I shall be sorry for. You have done that, you should be sorry for. There is no terror, Cassius, in your threats. For I am armed so strong in honesty that they pass me by as the idle wind which I respect not. I did send you for certain sums of gold which you denied me, for I can raise no money by vile means. By heaven, I'd rather coin my heart and drop my blood for drachmas than to wring from the hard hands of peasants their vile trash by any indirection. I did send you for gold to pay my legions which you denied me. Was that done by Cassius? I denied you not. You did! I did not! He was but a fool that brought my answer back. Brutus hath rived my heart. A friend should bear his friend's infirmities, but Brutus makes mine greater than they are. I do not till you practice them on me. You love me not. I do not like your faults. A friendly eye could never see such faults. Your flatterers would not, though he did appear as huge as high Olympus. Come, Antony and young Octavius, come. Revenge yourselves alone on Cassius, for Cassius is a weary of the world. Hated by one he loves, Braved by his brother, checked like a bondman, all his faults observed, set in a notebook, learned and conned by rote to cast into my teeth. Ah, I could weep my spirit from mine eyes. There's my dagger. I that denied thee gold will give my heart. Strike as thou didst at Caesar! For I know when thou didst hate him worst, thou lovest him better than ever thou lovest Cassius. Sheathe your dagger. 
Be angry when you will. It shall have scope. Do what you will. Dishonor shall be humor. Have Cassius lived to be but mirth and laughter to his Brutus, when grief and blood ill-tempered vexeth him? I was ill-tempered, too. Do you confess so much? Give me your hand. And my heart, too. I did not think you could have been so angry. <laughs> Cassius. I'm sick of many griefs. Of your philosophy, you make no use if you give place to accidental evil. Portia is dead. Portia? She's dead. Upon what sickness? Impatient of my absence and grief that young Octavius with Mark Antony made themselves so strong. For with her death, her tidings came. With this, she fell distracted. And died so? Even so. Deep of night has crept upon our talk. There's no more to say. No more. Good night. Early tomorrow will we rise and hence. Noble, noble Cassius. Good night. And good repose. resolved to meet the enemy on the plain of Philippi. Never had two such large Roman armies come together to engage each other. As soon as it was morning, the signal of battle, the scarlet coat, was sent out in Brutus and Cassius camps, and the two friends met for the last time in the middle space between their two armies. If we do lose this battle, then is this the very last time that we shall speak together? You are contented to be led in triumph through the streets of Rome? No, Cassius, no. Think not, thou noble Roman, that ever Brutus will go bound to Rome. He bears too great a mind. But this same day must end that work the Ides of March begun. And whether we shall meet again, I know not. Therefore, our everlasting farewell take. Forever and forever, farewell, Cassius. If we do meet again, why, we shall smile. If not, why then this parting was well made. Forever and forever, farewell, Brutus. If we do meet again, we'll smile indeed. If not, why then tis true, this parting was well made. Why then lead on? Oh, that a man might know the end of this day's business ere it come. But it sufficeth that the day will end. And then the end is known. Come ho! Away! In the beginning, the tide of battle was with Brutus. But soon, Cassius saw his whole army begin to give way. When he found that he could not even keep his own personal guard together, Cassius retired to an empty tent, taking along with him only Pindarus, one of his freemen. And pulling his cloak over his head, he made his neck bare and held it forth to Pindarus, commanding him to strike. Cassius' head was found severed from his body, and beside it was found the same knife with which he had stabbed Caesar. Some time later, Brutus, returning from the pursuit, wondered that he could not see Cassius' tent afar off, standing high as it was wont and appearing above the rest of the camp. 
Then, for the first time, he suspected the defeat of Cassius and made haste to him. He heard nothing of his death until he came to the camp. Where? Where, Miss Allard, does his body lie? Lo, yonder, he is slain. The last of all the Romans. Fare thee well. It is impossible that ever Rome should breed thy fellow. Friends, I owe more tears to this dead man than you shall see me pay. I shall find time, Cassius. I shall find time. Oh, Julius Caesar, thou art mighty yet. Thy spirit walks abroad and turns our swords in our own proper entrails. Let Julius show the torchlight, but my lord, he came not back. He is or ta'en or slain. Slaying is the word. It is a deed in fashion. Come hither, good Volumnius. This to word. What says my lord? Why this, Volumnius. The ghost of Caesar hath appeared to me several times by night at Sardis once, and this last night, here in Philippi Fields, I know my hour is come. Not so, my lord. Nay, I am sure it is, Volumnius. Thou knowest that we two went to school together. Even for that our love of old, I pray thee, hold thou my sword hilts, whilst I run on it. That's not an office for a friend, my lord. Fly, fly, my lord! There's no tarrying here. Farewell to you, and you, and you, Volumnius. Strato, thou hast been all this while asleep. Farewell to thee too, Strato. Countryman, my heart doth joy, that yet in all my life I found no man but he was true to me. I shall have glory by this losing day more than Octavius and Mark Antony by this vile conquest shall attain unto. So, fare you well at once. For Brutus's tongue hath almost ended his life's history. Night hangs upon mine eyes. My bones would rest that have but labored to attain this hour. Fly, my lord, fly! Hence! I will follow. I pray thee straight, O stay thou by thy lord. Thou art a fellow of a good respect, thy life hath had some smatch of honor in it. Hold then my sword. Turn away thy face while I do run upon it. Wilt thou straight, O? Give me your hand first. Fare you well, my lord. Farewell, good straight, O. Caesar, now be still. I killed not thee with half so good a will. Brutus' dead body was found by Antony, who commanded the richest purple mantle that he had to be thrown over it. Then, before the assembled armies, he spoke over the body of his enemy. This was the noblest Roman of them all. All the conspirators, save only he, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He, only in a general honest thought and common good to all, made one of them. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. <laughs> 